announcements really early, and we're really glad that you all came this morning, and we're going to try to get us off to a good start for today. Um, my name is Dana Calandrino. I am a counseling student here at Eastern Michigan University. Uh, my name is Caroline. I'm also a counseling student here. And I'm Katie Dunn. I'm in the Educational Leadership Program. All right. How many of you guys have had an assignment or project through work or school that you have really hated? Raise, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good. Well, us too, actually, and it was this assignment. Um, <laughs> we had to do a semester-long research project um, where we designed a focus group and just basically did a ton of research, and none of us were looking forward to it. And then one day, Caroline flagged me down, and she said, hey, I know this awesome classmate that we have, Katie, and I know that we're all really interested in women's studies and women's issues, and so I think it would be great if we did our project based on first-generation female college students and leadership roles and how they kind of develop their identity in a world that's constantly giving them other messages. I and said exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, you know, I, I want to do that. That sounds great. And it became this kind of call to action. And we all ended up loving the work that we did, and what we found was that it didn't end with the class for us. And so we're really excited to share this information with you guys today, and we're really glad that you came. And so the, th the student development theory that we use for this project is Marsha Baxter Magolda's theory of self-authorship, uh, one of my personal favorites. I think you guys love it as well. But this theory really defines the process a person goes from where they're looking at the external formulas and then developing their own journey in life. And so if you think about when you're a child, you really believe what authorities are telling you. You believe what they're telling you to think or feel. Excuse us while we walk <laughs> into the red oval. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but then you might reach a crossroads where you're starting to learn about other people's beliefs. You're learning more in, about the world. And you have to decide, am I going to continue down this path or really develop my own journey? And so that describes the theory of self-authorship. This development really happens across three dimensions, cognitive being what you might think or believe in life, interpersonal, deciding what kind of relationships you want with others, and then the intrapersonal of deciding how you're going to define yourself. We really like this theory because we thought it, it exemplifies the experience of a college student. When you come to college, you're bringing in all of the messages you've been told from your family, your friends, society overall. But again, you're meeting other people. You're learning different things. You're reaching that crossroads where you're going to decide what journey you want to follow for the rest of your life. All right. Um, so now that you've heard a little bit about the why, um, I'm going to step in and tell you a little bit about the how. Um, so, like Dana and Katie said, what we knew at first was that we wanted to interview first-generation female college student leaders. Um, what we didn't know was how um, and why. And so what we learned over the course of a lot of talking <laughs> was that uh, we, w we really wanted this focus group to be um, an environment for women to have conversations with women about their own identity development, um, about the identity development of others. Um, we wanted to be able to isolate and explore some of the experiences that had really you know, like inspired, influenced, challenged, and just generally shaped these women. And we knew that we wanted to do it from a lens of, OK, so what are the social messages you've been receiving along the way? Whether they were positive, negative, whether they were from peers, mentors, family members, whatever. Um, which, you know, um, is kind of a lot. You know? <laughs> it's a tough nut to crack, and there are a lot of places to start. Um, so the way that we decided to do it was that about two weeks before the focus group really met as a group, um, we administered a short, multiple choice uh, pre-survey. And so the survey was divided into themes. We asked the students to reflect on their past, uh, to look at the present, and then to anticipate the future. Um, and kind of the beauty of this was that I think it was really a win-win. Um, I think it helped the students. I think it helped them sort of like reflect on and ruminate and really have a lot of like deep, thoughtful dialogue to bring to our group, which obviously helped us too. <laughs> um, and then I think from another perspective, it really generated a lot of hard quantitative data that we were able to use as we sat down and prepared to facilitate it and really thought to ourselves, like, okay, who are these women? Who do we have in our group? Um, what are their stories? And how can we effectively help them process? So to give you kind of an example of how we use that really hard data and moved it into what ultimately was a really qualitative student-driven experience, um, I'm going to share one of the key findings that we pulled out of that pre-survey, which was that toward the beginning, we asked students, OK, so as a child, what was your favorite game of imagination? And a little over half of them responded with something career-oriented, so being a doctor, being a teacher, being the president, whatever. Um, and then later on in the survey, we asked them, OK, so like as it stands today, 
and you're looking forward into the future, what is your greatest ambition? And exactly zero of them responded with something career-oriented. Every single one of them had moved towards something that had to do with being a wife or a mother. Um, so as we sat down to process this, I want to make it really clear that what we weren't trying to do was assign value judgments. Okay, so we really weren't interested in like categorizing and creating this hierarchy of this is better than this, but is better than this. Like we weren't interested in that. What we were interested in is the process by which these women moved and made this pretty significant shift between domains. Um, and so we were kind of curious to see how that would play out in the focus group. And every single one of our participants reported hearing messages uh, that started deeply in childhood and continu continued on to today um, from people in their lives, from significant people, family members, particularly parents, um, also friends, media, whatever, that as a woman, this act of balancing was really hard. It was really important to have a successful domestic life, being a wife and a mother, but also a personal life. But because it's so hard, if you can't do both, it's really important to choose that domestic role and be that good wife and that good mother. Um, and so kind of that theme of balancing, of having to compromise, a lot of times at the expense of things you really wanted to do, really came through, both in our quantitative data and in the qualitative uh, focus group that followed it. And kind of another thing that fell into this, this external narratives that we were hearing, these messages coming in from other people, was this idea of practicality, which is kind of an interesting topic because there's really no objective construct here. What practicality means, essentially, is whether or not a certain person or group finds that a certain course of action might have an outcome that they consider unknown or risky. And so what that means is that different support networks have different ideas of what constitutes a risky outcome, and even different individuals within those support groups. And what comes out of this is a lot of times our students are left in the dark, where, where what they feel is practical for them is not consistent with the messages that they're getting from their support network. So for example, um, we had one student whose support network did not consider an investment in four years of education to be a practical idea. Um, don't know if you're going to get a job at the end of it, you're going to end up in debt, it's a huge decision. It would be much better if you just took a job straight out of high school and earned money and hopefully worked your way up by the end of those four years. And for our student, she just didn't see that as, as practical and she decided to go ahead and pursue her education anyway. Um, and another a couple of examples, actually. We had two women who were both interested in separate different careers in the arts. And the messages that they got from their support networks was, you're not going to get a job in that. And you need to pursue a traditional and conservative career path. And both of them, at least temporarily, decided to go that route. And what they found was that it wasn't practical for them in the sense that they were both depressed. They both reported feeling miserable and like they weren't being true to themselves. And they coped with this in different ways. So one of them decided to respond by teaching in the field that she loved and kind of compromising that way, while another one decided to completely reject the messages of her support network and go her own way, which is a really difficult decision for our young adult students to make, for anyone to make, really. Um, and what all of this comes down to is how we process the feedback that we're hearing. So as Caroline mentioned before, <laughs> This feedback comes from three main areas. The first is mentors, so like parents and teachers and people who we admire and look up to. The second is our peer groups, so close friends, classmates, colleagues. And then the third is media in the larger social context. Um, and what we find is that the first two groups, the, the mentors and the peers, those people are important to us, and they were important to our female participants. These were people who they loved and they admired. And their approval or disapproval was a very personal and intimate thing for them. Um, and then the second, or the third object, which was the media and the social context, was not as personable or as personal, but it was deeply, deeply pervasive. Um, and so what we find is that this, this processing, parsing your voice out from the hundreds of other incoming messages telling you what to do and who to be, becomes a lifelong and ongoing process. And kind of continuing with the messages they were receiving, uh, we had a long discussion about what it meant to be a leader. Remember, these were students that were recommended to us as leaders on campus here at Eastern, and oftentimes they didn't see themselves as leaders at all. These were women that had stepped into roles 
kind of out of convenience in a way of there was something going on in their student organization, something was falling through the cracks, and they just stepped in to carry on, make sure something happened. So they weren't really the people that were necessarily lobbying for a leadership role. They weren't campaigning for this, but they were filling the role that was so desperately needed within their organizations. Um, they viewed leaders on campus as being very extroverted, being high profile, being the ones that you really know. And since they didn't view themselves as this whatsoever, they were having a hard time reconciling, am I a leader or am I just part of this organization? Again, a lot of this was messages that they had received from peers, from society, of what it meant to be a leader. Also, part of this was deciding their leadership role and their leadership style that they were having. Um, a lot of you might have heard lately about this whole idea of women leaning in in the workplace. You need to be at the table. You need to be more aggressive. However, the students we talked to had received mixed messages about this. The ones that felt they had tried to do this, um, be more aggressive, they oftentimes were told that they were being way too bitchy. The students in their student orgs didn't respect that. They didn't want to follow what they were saying. On the other hand, the students that had made the conscious effort to not go that route were told over and over that they were being too nice and that the other students were taking advantage of them. So we heard that there was this constant line that all the students were trying to walk of balancing being too nice and too bitchy. And I think if you pay attention to the media in the past week, that's, that discussion is still happening. Um, women trying to figure out what their place is in the workplace and what type of leader they're going to be. Going into career choice, there seemed to be this clear path of either you take the masculine route or you take the feminine route. And they had to decide that at an early stage. What route am I going to take? Am I going to take a more masculine route of trying to break into the arts industry and it's going to be male dominated and I might never be respected? Or am I going to take a more female oriented route where I might have an easier time of balancing my work and my family, but am I ever going to achieve the career that I really was hoping to have at one point? So there's this constant compromise. What type of leader am I? What style am I going to use? What career am I going to choose? And we heard this over and over. Um, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, basically what all of this data boils down to is um, that supportive influences are the most important thing that we can possibly offer our students. Um, one thing that we found in our group is that absolutely no one had never been supported. Um, at some point, someone, a teacher or a friend or a parent or a distant family member had supported and encouraged them and had been listening for their voice and had helped them draw that out and do what they wanted to do. Uh, a huge part of this is the family support system. If you think back to the three dimensions I mentioned earlier with the development, is cognitive, interpersonal, and intrapersonal. Family plays a huge factor in all three of those areas of development. And so for everyone here, I would encourage you to support your family members. Support the people in your life that might be in college right now because they need someone to support them in making their decisions and really creating that path for themselves. Um, so what can we do as peers? What can we do for each other? Um, for every single one of um, the women who we talked to, they said that it was the first chance that they'd had to really explore and reflect on their experiences as something real and meaningful and not something to blow off or not consider, and that it was a shared experience, something that every woman in that room could relate to. And the word that one of them used to describe it was validating. And every other woman in that room was like, yes, yes, this experience has been validating. And so what we need to do with each other is have those discussions, be listening to what each other is saying, draw that out, support them, and encourage them to, to write their own stories. And so really similarly, the last thing that we wanted to touch on during this talk is kind of this role of the student affairs professional, the faculty member, or even the advanced student leader as a mentor. Because what we found is that it's so, like Dana said, it's so important, right? Um, I think it's really kind of our duty to actively look out for, proactively seek, and engage these students in these difficult conversations, you know, because they're having to make difficult choices. They're having to ask themselves really difficult questions. Is it really worth it to disregard all these messages I've gotten from my mother, from my best friend from the lead in my favorite TV show. Um, it's difficult. I think it's really important. Um, I think it can make a lot of difference because what we learned from our focus group um, is that for all of our participants, somewhere, somewhere along the line, somebody did that and it made all of the difference. 
So that, that's all we've got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank guys. you so much for listening. <laughs>